I have a few announcements this morning. You may notice in your bulletin the information about the Sandy Creek Teen Retreat that's going to be April the 4th through 6th. And we have information up here still on uh, those that might be interested. And the cost of that's going to be $74 per person, per teen. And if that's going to be a struggle for you, then the church will help you with that. Um, we don't want any teens not being able to go to this if they want to because of the cost. And uh, we don't have that much time now in order to uh, get our paperwork in for that. Uh, the pa this, these uh, pages down here are just to let you know about the time and some information about it. Uh, but there are certain forms you need to get into them regarding health and who to contact in emergency and that type of thing. So if you want to go, let me or one of the deacons know so that we can get these farms to you so you can get your kids to uh, go to that retreat. There'll be three or four other Bible doctrinal uh, churches that are going to attend. I heard a couple of weeks ago there was already tw 20 teens signed up. So I hope we have at least someone from Country Bible Church that's going to attend since it's in Washington County and um, right here in our own backyard. Also, we're going to have, let's see, I think this is, uh, is this going to be Friday, Friday fun night? Is that this? Okay. Now, this will be Friday fun night. That will be Friday the 21st. No? The 28th. Okay. So, it won't be Friday fun first. I mean, the, the Friday the 21st will be the 28th. Friday is... Uh, yeah, the, the 28th, and I'm on the right month, so. I was wondering why I didn't have it in the bulletin. Now I understand. Okay, let's prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer. The opportunity to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you are our God and that we have the foundation under us that never wobbles. It's absolutely, completely, and totally sturdy. We thank you for your phenomenal word that you have preserved over the ages for us. We thank you that you have given us the grace system of perception that we can understand the whole realm of doctrine. We can go as far as our positive volition can take us. We thank you for this time that we have today to focus on your message in the stars. Not many believers even know that it's there, and yet it has been preserved through all these ages. We pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate so that we can have a true appreciation of what you've done for us, not only in your written word, but also in your word, the message in the stars. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, last Sunday, we weren't able to be on the stars because I gave you a report that took the whole time on the uh, Schaefer conference. So I think a good place to begin today would be, and uh, George, you can kill the lights overhead, if you will. To review the uh, Act 1 and Act 2, there's 12 constellations and each section of the sky is cut in actually divided into three parts you could call acts as if it was a, a great pageant panorama in the sky and act one has to do with the redeemer promised all these constellations that we're looking at here have to do with the promise of the messiah and redemption we started with virgo which is the woman and the seed are the woman with the seed, and of course Virgo is the uh, virgin. Very important because Christ had to be born of a virgin to be qualified to go to the cross. Otherwise, he would have uh, had an old sin nature and been disqualified. Then we have three constellations that uh, are associated with Virgo. Uh, in astronomy, they're called deacons, spelled D-E-C-O-N-S. And coma is the desired of the nation. 
Uh, that was the woman that was seated and holding the child. Then we have centaurus, which is the dual-natured centaur. Centaur is half man and half horse, showing the dual nature of uh, Jesus Christ. He's 100% uh, deity and 100% humanity united in one person. Then we had Boetes which is the exalted shepherd and harvester. That makes up the first one. The second one is Libra. Libra is the scales and the required price paid. Because God is perfect in every way, he has essence that is absolutely um, impeccable. Therefore, the scales comes next to show that mankind is lacking. Every person who was ever born was born with an old sin nature. Furthermore, he has Adam's original sin imputed to him. Also, he sins personally. And the scale shows that uh, we are all wanting, lacking what we need in order to be accepted by God. The first associate constellation is Crux, C-R-U-X, and it is the cross to be endured. So that is the price that must be paid that only Christ could pay and that is spiritual death on the cross it wasn't his physical death it was the spiritual death that paid for our so great salvation the second one is lupus which is the slain victim which of course was Christ the sacrifice and then the third is corona the crown purchased and so Jesus Christ someday is going to be uh, returning to earth, set up his millennial kingdom, and he will be indeed king and be crowned. The third one is Scorpio. This is referring to the conflict. Out of all the constellations, this is my favorite because it shows so much of the action and so much of the story in this one constellation. So Scorpio is the scorpion, and you have... Um, Three associate ones here. Serpents is the snake, the serpent. And it is, serpent uh, is reaching up, trying to get the crown. Ophiuchus is the mighty one who handles the serpent. He's the ser serpent handler, and this represents Jesus Christ. And in the constellation, Ophiuchus has two hands on that snake. And as it is reaching for the crown, he's got it. It's not going anywhere. And then uh, we have Hercules, the mighty man, humbled yet victorious, also representing Christ. Then to end this first act, we have Sagittarius, which is the archer with the drawn bow. And you'll remember that Sagittarius is down on one knee and he's got the, the, draw, or the uh, bow drawn and the arrow is pointed at the heart of the scorpion, which is the giant red star called Antares. Then we have Lyra, which is the harp or the lyre of gladness because the scorpion representing Satan is going to be destroyed. Then we have Aura, which is the fire of judgment and Draco the dragon cast down. That's act one. Act two is the Redeemer's people. It talks about the Redeemer's focusing on the people this time and what it takes to... Redeem them. The first one in it is Capricorn or Capricornus, the sea goat, life out of death. Y'all remember the sea goat? Do you remember that it has two natures as well? It looks like a goat that is dying with its front legs extended. But then the last part or the, the, the end part of this goat is a tail of a fish. Again, two natures, life coming out of death. We have Sagitta, which is the arrow of God, which um, is just in the heavens. It doesn't appear to be piercing anyone in particular because it is piercing everyone. Then we have Aquila, the eagle, that is the falling eagle. And then we have Delphinus springing up in resurrection from the death. That little, remember the little constellation made up of five stars and it looks like it's leaping up out of the water? Then we have Aquarius, the water of life poured out on the redeemed. Three associate ones are Pisces, which is, or excuse me, 
Piscis, which is drinking the heavenly food. Pegasus, the white horse, and uh, the return of the Redeemer. Y'all remember the great white winged horse. Then we have uh, Cephas, which is the crowned king. Every time the last one brings it around to show there's a victory in each one of these. What? Cygnus? Oh, I'm, did I, I miss Cygnus. Okay. Uh, Cygnus is the swan and the return, or return of the Redeemer. Just like geese and, and, and swans are migratory birds, there's one thing you can always count on, and what is that? They're going to return every year. Uh, this, this spring, or it was nearly spring, I was outside and you hear them honking as they come over. I, I, just, I just stop wherever I am and I watch and wonder. And they're, they're uh, flying in that V formation. How do they know to fly in that V formation? How do they know to come back? And how do they know where to go? I mean, their, si their brain is about the size of a marble, I would imagine. Well, it's because this is the way that God had create, has created them. And sure enough, just as, just as sure as they're coming back, our Lord is going to return. Okay, now we get to Piscis, deliverance out of bondage. And we have the, excuse me, Pisces, deliverance out of bondage. And Pisces is the two fish <clears throat> that are springing up but they are tied together by, uh, by their tails with this band, and that's the second, uh, or the first, the associate ones, upheld and governed by the, the lamb. So you have the redeemed people, but they are tied, tied down. They're, they're uh, it's, it's somewhat un, in bondage. And then you have Andromeda. And Andromeda <clears throat> is the intended bride bound and afflicted. Remember the woman, that had, she has chains on her, on her wrists and on her ankles, but the chains have been broken. And then we have uh, Cephas, the crowned king. And that, of course, would be Jesus Christ. Then the last one we have, so we, we're going to so far, is Aries. Aries is the lamb. When, Je when uh, John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And the lamb had to be... Uh, crucified, had to be sacrificed in order for us to have our so great salvation. And then we have Cassiopeia, which is uh, the woman sitting on the throne. And that's where we ended last time. Today we're going to pick up with Cetus and Perseus. So here we have the constellation of Aries. And I brought in two other constellations from Pisces. This is Andromeda. Here's the chains of the woman. This is the redeemed, yet this is referring... One aspect of it is Israel was uh, uh, dispersed throughout all the, the, the land, all the earth, but now she's going to be... Now she's back in, the, in uh, Israel. And this Andromeda who is chained now was... Or in, our, in Aries is the, the queen or the woman sitting on the crown uh, on the throne and you have Cephas which is the king looks like he is extending his scepter out to her so this is the before and this is the after regarding Cassiopeia and now we're looking at uh, Aries is the lamb we've gone over it already and now Cetus this sea monster down here and we're going to see what Cetus is all about Cetus is the largest constellation in all the sky, but the stars in it are rather dim. The sea master re represents Satan and the enemies of God. Cetus is identified with Leviathan in Job. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Job chapter 41 verse 9. Can y'all see or do we need to turn the side lights on here and see if they can see with the side lights? Yes, it's Job 41, 9. Mm -hmm. Job 41, 9. 
Job 41.9. Indeed, any hope of overcoming him, and him here is referring to Leviathan, and Leviathan is spelled L-E-V-I-A-T-H-A-N. Indeed, any hope of overcoming him, Leviathan, is false. Shall one not be overwhelmed at the sight of him? No one is so fierce that he should dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand against me? So what you have in this portion of Job is Job was trying to figure out why all the calamity had fallen upon him and he was asking God questions. And you would think that when you experience what Job did, I mean, Job is the epitome of suffering in the Old Testament. It's not 41.9, that's what I have down here. That's not 41.9? No, I, I, I should have told you, Leviathan is in brackets. That's who, that's who he's talking about here. It says, indeed, any hope of overcoming him and the him, I, I'm, I, see, I'm reading it and I'm thinking, well, you're, you're looking at what I'm looking at, but you're not. 41.1? Oh, okay. Did I say that first? Okay, let me, let me go to my Bible because I'm, I'm looking at my notes and my notes are fallible, but the Bible is not. Yeah. Okay, let me see what... what is okay, it's Job 41.1. Okay, I had the wrong address here. Job 41.1, canst you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Now, Leviathan is referring to Cetus, the sea monster, in, in, the, in the stars anyway. And what I was saying, God is ask, answering Job's questions with questions. Now, you know that's right down my alley. That's what I like. But here you have Job suffering more than any other person that I'm aware of in the, in the Bible other than Jesus Christ. And rather than giving Job answers, he's asking him questions like that. He says, can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook? In other words, can you go fishing for this great sea monster with a with a hook? Well, you might be able, you might put your line out there, but there's not a, a rod and reel. There's no uh, no one that could bring in this sea monster or press down his tongue with a cord. Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a with a hook? Now, the answer to all these, of course, is what? No, you can't do it. And in this whole portion of Job, God keeps asking, can you hang the world on nothing? Can you, can you tell me what the foundation of the earth is, what it's sitting on? He's asking Job all these questions, question after question after question. And what, what, is, what is the purpose of this? God was saying, look, Job, I know what I'm doing. And you're questioning me? And by the time you get to the end of Job, Job is saying, Lord, I know nothing. Essentially, I think, reading behind the lines, he's saying, I wish I never asked that question to begin with. But the reason we're going here is because it has Leviathan. And the Le Leviathan is a great uh, monster. People can't... It's just a, a, a great huge beast is how it's used in the Bible. Sometimes I saw some... Uh, commentaries that says that it refers to the hippopotamus as a great uh, huge beast and that uh, y'all ever seen the hippopotamus when it opens its mouth you know it looks like a a, a, a very um, 
slow, lumbering beast, but they say that it can move, especially very quickly in the water, and a lot of people are killed uh, by uh, hippos each year. Okay, let's see if I got this one right. Turn to Isaiah 27.1. Isaiah 27, 1. I'm being safe. I'm going to my Bible first. Okay. In that day, and where it says day, you might put in parentheses or in brackets, it's referring to the second advent. In that day, the second advent, the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, and his fierce and great and mighty sword. With his fierce and great and mighty sword, Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. That is referring to Cetus. I'm, I'm giving you verses to connect what Cetus is referring to in this message of Aries, in the constellation of Aries and these accompanying constellations. So in this verse, we have that Christ is going to return, second advent, when he's going to return to do what? Punish Leviathan. Uh, kill my lights only, George. Just, just, oh, they're already off, okay. Uh, here's what Cetus looks like in the stars. These con we've connected the dots here, and, he, and this is the configuration of Cetus. Here's where he looks like. Go ahead and kill the other ones for a moment, because I think it'll help. Uh, can, do we need the side ones off too? Okay, it's okay. All right, here we have that arc, the zodiac, or the ecliptic that goes through the sky. Here's where we have Capricornus here. This looks like a kind of a triangle. Uh, we have Aquarius here, which is just nondescript. Then we have Pisces. These are the two fish with the band connected to the band. And, it's, and when you see the sea monster, it looks like they are connected to, by the bands, the two fish, and he's dragging them down. Up here we have the great square of Pegasus. Here's the head of the horse, the front legs, the hind legs. This is also Andromeda here. And then we have um, where we're going next over here is Taurus. But this shows where it, where it is in the sky here. This is an artist's conception of what Cetus may look like. Uh, he's got a fish tail. He's got kind of legs in front with... Uh, Claws. Here's what he looks like um, in a star chart, and we have some. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We have some star names that help us give the image uh, the meaning. Uh, this star is called Menkar, M-E-N-K-A-R, and it means the enemy bound. Here we have Mira, which means the rebel, and here we have. Dipta, dipta, which it means overthrown. So all these words shows that he has been subdued, he's been overthrown, he's been bound. Now you see, here's Pisces here. Do you see this little circle here? It says M77. That would be Messier's number. Messier was an astronomer who cataloged and, and gave uh, certain uh, deep sky objects names. And this is what that looks like. This is the uh, M77, the Cetus galaxy. So you can hardly even notice that it was on the star chart, but if you had a big enough telescope, zero, and that's a spiral gal galaxy. I just, galaxy is beautiful. Okay, this is what Cetus, uh, I, I saw this on a, I was trying to find the scariest picture of Cetus is what I was really trying to do. And uh, 
you see this up on the screen, but if you woke up in the middle of the night and you saw this in your bedroom, I believe it would give you pause. And it, th I, let's see if I can read this here. I was able to read it right off the... Uh, well, maybe I can read it off of here. Um, this says, the seat... The Cetus was um, a ferocious sea monster created by um, Poseidon, god of the sea. Uh, can y'all see that better than me? Because I'm strange. Can somebody read it? <laughs> okay so we, we, we already have a hint of uh, Cetus is going to be the hero in all this so I wanted to give you that to show you uh, the star names mainly okay uh, hit the lights again George you're going to be our light man you need, you need a little deal in front of you George has to get a crick in his neck Okay, Psalm 74. Turn to Psalm 74, 13. How many of you have ever heard of Leviathan? Have you all heard that term before? Some have, some haven't. Okay. Psalm 74. If you're talking about something really huge and scary... You could, so I've heard it called a Leviathan. I've heard of a, a, you know, the linemen on professional football teams have nicknames. I remember one of them, his name was Refrigerator. And um, uh, recently, I, one of them name was Pot Roast. But I've heard them described as being a Leviathan before. Okay, Psalm 74, 13. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea serpents in the waters. You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave him as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. I think it's interesting that it's talking, it, you broke the heads of Leviathan. What does that make you think of? What verse? Genesis three fifteen. right. Okay, so here you have, uh, again, the idea of Leviathan, this great sea monster being, uh, being destroyed, being conquered. I'm just going to go through some of these verses and still have you turn to them for brevity. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 and 2, is describing again the uh, second... Um, Advent, and it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And all this, see, you have dragon, you have serpent, you could also, uh, uh, devil, Satan, you could also add to this list Leviathan. Because that's what Leviathan is representing in the stars here. The, love, the Lamb of God will overcome the Leviathan, the dragon, the serpent, the scorpion, all of which depict Satan and the enemies of God. Now we have one more constellation in Act 2 in the constellation of Aries. And it's Perseus. Now, yeah, this one's going to be doesn't make any difference. Does that, does that help any? Okay. There, that helped. Okay. This is what the constellation Perseus looks like. I mean, you, these are connected dots here, and you still say, okay, they're connected. What is it? I mean, we could probably all come up with our own idea what this might be uh, because most of the constellations don't look like what they're depicting. This is one of them. But we have Perseus here. Um, you see this little, little cross here? It says NGC 1499. That is a National General Catalog, number 1499. They've cataloged this. I'll show you what that is. 
This is a nebula. See it right here? And it's called the California Nebula. Can you see California there? Huh? Not much, but they have to name them something. Instead of calling it the blob, they say, okay, okay this is California. California Nebula. Now, nebula is hot gas and dust that has uh, light reflecting off of it. And uh, sometimes they are huge. Well, they're all huge, but I mean, some, some are bigger than others. I just thought that was neat. Um, you can't, uh, if you could see it on my computer screen, it was, it's very vivid. It's kind of washed out here, but that's what it looks like through a telescope. Now, Perseus is called the breaker, delivering the redeemed. So this is representing Jesus Christ who is going to deliver uh, this old world from the state of it's in now. Perseus is the mighty man in the last constellation in Act 2 of the panorama in the sky. He's a strong soldier with a helmet on his head and a sword in his right hand. And in his left hand, he has the head uh, of his adversar adversity, adversar adversary, which is Medusa. Here's another. Can you see the... Here are the stars we looked at a moment ago. And here is... he's. He's got this leg up in the air. This is his sword here. And this arm comes down and is holding all this right here is the head of Medusa. This is his other leg here. Can y'all see that all right? Some of the star names, I think, are uh, telling in this. Here you have Mirfak, M-I-R-F-A-K, which means who helps, one who helps. Here we have al Ganib which who carries away, he's carrying away the head of the enemy. Here we have At Atik, A-T-I-K, which means who breaks. This is the one down here in his foot. And then we have Algol, the evil spirit, or Rosh, Satan, the head of the adversary. Here it is right here. Algol are sometimes pronounced al -ghul. Have you ever heard of ghouls before? Around uh, Halloween time? Well, Perseus is the Greek name and comes from the Hebrew parats, P-A-R-A-T-Z, meaning the breaker. The prophet Micah used this name for Christ when he regathers Israel. So we know that Israel is already regathered in unbelief, but Israel is going to be regathered again at the second advent. In Micah 2, chapter 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 12 through 13 says, quote, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. They will be noisy with men. The breaker. Won't y'all turn there? Micah. Y'all, uh, did I hear some groans out there? I know that you're not groaning because you don't want to go there. You're trying to find Micah. Is that right? Yeah, can you hit the lights again, George? George, you might as well sit sideways so you can get to those lights easier. Okay. It's right after Jonah, I believe. Oh, thank you. Big help, huh? M Micah chapter 2. Micah comes right before Nahum. Why you laugh? You know what I thought about doing, and I might very well do, is uh, maybe when I'm through with the Star Series, I might... Uh, teach the minor prophets. And so when you hear these names, it won't be, what? Those are in the Bible? Okay. Micah chapter 2, verse 12. I will assembly, surely assemble you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in the fold, like the flock, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. They will be noisy with men. The breaker goes up before them. Underline the breaker. Who is that referring to? Jesus Christ. See, you would never know this 
that that breaker has significance because that is the Hebrew name given to this constellation in the stars, which is a, we call Bers, a Perseus, but it, in the Hebrew it's Pirates, P-A-R-A-T-Z, meaning the breaker. Now what does a breaker do? He breaks, doesn't he? I remember my dad used to tell me when I, that I was like a bull in a china closet, closet. Well, that's coming in the next constellation, which is Taurus, the bull. But if he would have known about the breaker, he would have said, you know what, you're like the breaker. Of course, I never, he would never allow me in a, in a china shop, no way. The breaker goes up before them. They break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. So their king goes before them and the Lord at their head. And the king and the Lord is the breaker who goes before us. He's the one that broke the chains that bound um, Andromeda. Remember that? He's the one that broke the bands that had what was tail, uh, tied to the tail of the fish. He's the one who sets us free. Christ is seen going ahead of his people, releasing them from the place of their captivity and breaking down the doors and the gates that held them in. Did he do that in Egypt? Isn't that what he did? He broke the slavery that had held them for 430 years. Perseus is the one who breaks the chains of Andromeda, Andromeda and Pisces, the bands, who, and he's the one who sub, subdues Cetus, the sea monster. And what about this Medusa business? I mean, holding this head. Um, the Greeks, the Greek myths which tell that Perseus cut off the head of Medusa, a gorgon, and then freed the beautiful Andromeda from the sea monster to become his wife, are but a faint echo of the victory won by the great Perseus, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, did you hear me say about the Gorgon? You know what? The Gorgon. I, I, uh, I didn't say Gorgile. I said Gorgon. Um, well, that bothered me because I didn't know what it was, so I looked it up. In Greek mythology, a Gorgon, actually plural, Gorgons, or ancient Greek, in the ancient Greek, is a female creature. The name derives from the ancient Greek word gorgos, G-O-R-G-O-S, which means dreadful. While descriptions of gorgons vary across Greek literature, the term commonly refers to any of three sisters who had hair made of living venomous snakes and <clears throat> as well as a horrifying visage that turned those who beheld her to stone. Traditionally, while two of the Gorgons were immortal, uh, Sethno and Uriel, their sister Medusa was not, and she was slain by the hero Perseus. Now, that's Greek mythology, but I thought I'd show you a little more about this if you'd hit, kill the lights again, George. This is what... Uh, a more visual picture of what Perseus looks like. He's got his sword up, by, he's a soldier, he's got his helmet on here, and he's carrying the head of Medusa. Here is a, a picture of, you have Perseus here. This is a statue, I'm not sure, I think it's in Italy. He's holding the head of Medusa and he's standing on her corpse after he just cut the head off. Here's a little closer picture of it. He's got his sword here. Here's her head. This is what Medusa looks like in one artist's rendition. I don't know if that would make you turn to stone. It would certainly give you pause. With that hairdo, I believe it would... Uh, uh, maybe you you ladies have had a bare, bad hair day, but I don't think you ever had one like that. Hopefully not. <laughs> yeah, that kind of looks like Lady Gaga, doesn't it? Maybe she's uh, Ken to Medusa. I don't know. If this one doesn't get you, maybe this one will. 
I believe that would turn me to stone. I had, uh, when I was working with a plumber one time, uh, as a plumber, uh, this, this, one of the guys I was working with was always describing what his wife looked like before she had coffee in the morning. <laughs> this comes to mind, I guess. <laughs> okay, so that is Medusa. And, you know, we were talking about a Gorgon, G-O-R, G-O-N. and the Greek, it comes from Gorgos, G-O-R, G-O-S. And it made me think, have you ever heard of a Gorgile? I believe it comes from the same thing. And here's what a Gorgile looks like. A, a, gar, a Gargoyle, excuse me. I always pronounce them Gorgiles, and once you start saying it enough you, that's it. a gargoyle uh, these usually are are on build older buildings and they're sometimes at the corners have y'all seen those before younger people probably not so much have, have y'all ever seen one you have have y'all ever seen them <laughs> <You're kidding. laughs> these teenagers are all saying yes and here pete which is a senior senior citizen You've never seen one. I mean, it, they all don't look exactly like this, but they're always grotesque looking. And they're carved out of, uh, I don't know, they look like they're carved out of stone. They're on the old building. How many people remember the Esperson building, downtown Houston? Didn't it have some of these? I believe it did, Gorgoth. And I'm just trying to connect the dots here. I might be sinking, but I don't know. I'm, you have Gorgon, this is Gorgoyle. And it has to do uh, with, uh, something that is uh, dreadful, evil, hideous. Now, what we're looking at here is... Go ahead and turn the lights on, if you will, George. What, what we're seeing in these constellations is something that I hope we all appreciate. Because we live in a world that is dark, and becoming darker every day. There is evil all around us. And as we see it uh, get worse and worse, as the Bible describes it's going to be, and it seems like there is no solution, doesn't it? And, and you think about all the people, all the brilliant people, the people who are supposed to have all the answers and don't have the answers to make it better. In fact, a lot, if not most of what they do, keep making it worse. And what this... Aries and these three constellations that go with it, what they do for me is give me hope. And I'm not talking about the winning the lottery kind of hope. I'm talking about the absolute confidence that what we see here in Perseus, what we've seen in uh, Cephas, what we've seen throughout these uh, star message is that Jesus Christ is the only one that is able to set things straight and he will do it. He's going to do it. And that's at the second advent. When he returns, he's going to set this whole mess straight. Aren't you going to be glad? Wouldn't you like to live in a world with perfect environment and all the evil and all the uh, dreadfulness that we see every day and the, and the uh, persecution in well, it's going to end. And that, I probably should stop right now because that's a perfect ending uh, for this set of constellations. But I never end when I'm supposed to. If I have four, five more minutes, I'm going to use it. So it is also, though, a good introduction to our, our next series of stars, at least we can get a, a, a shot at these, and that is Act 3, Act 3 is about to begin, here it is, these are the last, uh, this is the last act, and this has to do with redemption being completed, and what we're going to look at, maybe if we get a chance, uh, some of it, some, uh, today is Taurus. It's the bull, the invincible ruler comes. This is talking about 
the second advent, when Jesus Christ returns. But it's not the bull that you're thinking of. Probably when you're thinking of, when you hear the word bull, you think about the big uh, bulls that the um, cowboys ride at the rodeo. And uh, what happens after a cowboy gets bucked off or else uh, the, he eventually gets off after eight seconds? What does the bull do? Sometimes he'll go at the clowns a little bit, but then he just, t just trots right back into where he came from. That is not the bull that we're going to reference here. This is a completely different bull. In fact, it's a bull that is extinct today. But we'll get into that more next time. So Taurus the bull is the invincible rule and the ruler comes. This is Jesus Christ. And he is going to judge this world at the second advent. The next um, constellation in this Taurus group is Orion. The Prince of Glory triumphs. Y'all remember Orion, don't you? Oh, Orion's beautiful. Then we have Eridanus, E-R-I-D-A-N-U-S, which is the river of fire and judgment. And then we have Auriga, A-U-R-I-G-A, which is the all-ruling shepherd. You see it every time on the end, the, the third one, you have the overcomer, you have the, the good part. We go through the river of fire, judgment, but then the all-ruling shepherd. Then we have Gemini, the twins, and the coming of the prince and savior. Then we have Lepus, the enemy trodden underfoot, Canis Major, which is the prince coming in glory, and Canis Minor, the coming redeemer. Now, this, by the way, Canis uh, Major is right under uh, the constellation Orion, and Canis Major has the brightest star in the heavens. Anybody know what it is? Uh, You've got to be serious about it. <laughs> it's a serious star. That's how I can remember it anyway. Um, then we have cancer, which is the possession secured. Then you have Ursa Minor, the sheepfold, and Ursa Major, the assembled flock. Do you know what we call those? Yeah, are the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. It's also a name for them. Then we have Argo, the ship in harbor, travels safely home. And then we have the last one, and uh, it's my, I guess, second favorite one. <laughs> the lion, the king triumphant. Jesus Christ is coming back as the lion of Judah. That was the uh, sign for the tribe of Judah was the lion. In fact, that's what most of these are for, about. And you have the lion, uh, the king coming back. Triumphant, and you have Hydra, the serpent destroyed, Crater, which is the wrath of God poured out, and then you have Corvus, which is the raven, the carcass devoured. Isn't that amazing? We made full circle, and by the time you get to these, you start with the virgin, by the time you get to Corvus, you have the raven uh, eating the carcasses and devouring them. You see the story there? You see it? Yeah, but the, it's the highlights. You know, they say the devil is in the details, but the um, it's the highlights are what really makes it vivid in these. I can't wait to tell you about Crater and Corvus. Yeah, anybody in here know anything about Crater and Corvus? Okay, well, that's a good way to end it. All right. Um, well, let's at least take a look at Taurus before we leave. Here is Taurus the bull. All you see is the front portion of him and he's head down and he's charging. And you have uh, next Orion which is, here is the two famous, well you have three famous stars in here. First of all you have Betelgeuse. Y'all remember the movie Betelgeuse? Some people pronounce this Bejelsey but I like Betelgeuse. And then down here you have Rigel. Uh, this is a beautiful white star, just a big uh, uh, category one in brightness. And then Betelgeuse is uh, more of a red star. You know, I don't know if you can see in the, in the city, but when you're out in the country, just with the naked eye, you can look up and you can see the different star colors. And they have different uh, qualities to them. Uh, then you have 
Eridanus, which is the river of judgment, the river of fire. See, going here. And then up here, you have Origa, which is uh, the shepherd. Okay? We'll get into that next time. And don't forget about if you have um, teens that are going to go to the Sandy Creek Retreat, let me know so that we can give you the papers, okay? Uh, let's everyone bow your heads now. I like to give the gospel on Sundays uh, because you never know who might be here that really doesn't understand the gospel. Those that are live streaming or those that will get this later on the internet. All of, this, all of these uh, accounts, this message in, in the stars, is telling the message that Jesus Christ, who is depicted in all of these various ways, is the Son of God who went to the cross and took care of your sin problem and my sin problem. He died, he was buried, and now he rose from the grave and offers eternal life as a gift to anyone who will trust him and him alone. For eternal life. The fact is that Jesus Christ. Paid it all. There's nothing left. As he hung on the cross. He said. Tetelestai. It is finished. The only thing left is to receive it. And the way you receive it. Is simply by. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And his work. Rather than your own good works. And in that moment. You're born again. And you become. A child of God. Permanently, your ticket to heaven is guaranteed all because of his phenomenal grace. Now, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to go through these messages that you have left permanently in the stars for us to revel in, for us to marvel at, and to have great gratitude that you have preserved these for even us. And we pray that you will help us to meditate on these things and that we will it will make a big difference in our lives as we go forward as being good and faithful servants. And we pray this all in Christ's most high and holy name. Amen.